Yes, thank you. Right. Hello, um, it's a pleasure to be here. So let's talk about financial technology. Uh, in the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to reveal to you some key insights uh, about fintech and why I believe uh, not just finance professionals, but all of us have to care about how the fintech phenomenon is changing and touching our lives. Uh, but before that, uh, let, me, let me put a question to you. Uh, can you raise your hand if you have a mobile phone right now? So almost all of you, which is not surprising. Uh, but can you guess what percentage of the world's population in 1990 had mobile phones? Uh, so the answer to that is less than 1%, 0.2%. Um, that's a very, very low percentage. Uh, so two in every thousand people. And of course, those were not anything like the smartphones you have, this bulky, uh, quite basic items. Um, so if a technology can go from 0% adoption to 100% adoption within less than three decades, that's a striking example of very fast-paced adoption. But if you think this is fast, then the um, adoption of some of the fintech innovations that I'm going to talk about is significantly faster. Uh, <clears throat> now, when you hear the word uh, fintech, most people think about blockchain and cryptocurrencies, which we'll come to, but uh, fintech is not really a new concept. Even ATM machines uh, at their time were fintech innovations in the 1960s, or debit cards and credit cards. But what has made fintech go um, so en masse is, is just the pace of innovation in this space. Uh, the, the rate of innovation and the abundance of new technologies, which have sprung up everywhere. Now, uh, what, is, what is blockchain? Uh, without going too much into the technology, uh, blockchain, you can think of it as these spreadsheets or ledgers, which are distributed around the world, on, built on the internet. Um, so as opposed to the old system where you would have just one copy of a central ledger. Now you have thousands of these copies of the same ledger, uh, and they're all linked together, together and constantly synced together, which makes it cryptographically very, very safe. And on, on this infrastructure, you can build anything. You can build uh, digital currencies like cryptos. You can build contracts and uh, pretty much anything that's worth uh, making a record of. For example, in the future, it would be very uh, likely that when you, when you purchase property, that record might, might just be implemented on the blockchain, and people are working towards that. Uh, so it wouldn't be an exaggeration to call the fintech phenomenon a fintech disruption. In fact, I believe it's the prototypical uh, example of a disruption. It has already touched uh, your lives in so many different ways. Uh, think about mobile banking that you can do on your phones uh, anywhere in the world at any, at any given time. Uh, think about new forms of insurance that you can purchase uh, and customize, again, uh, through new innovative platforms. Think about the world of personal finance. Uh, well, in the old days, you would have gone to a financial advisor to get advice. Now you have also have the option of getting advice from algorithms and softwares, otherwise known as robo-advisors. And quite a, quite a range of other areas. Uh, let's think about payments, lending, capital markets. Uh, all of these um, sub-areas of the fintech landscape are being touched um, and influenced by, by the fintech innovations. So these are some of the uh, um, companies which are currently very active in the world of uh, payments and money transfer. And while they use different technologies, perhaps the common denominator is that they're all very young companies. They've all, they've all been established within the past decade or two. Uh, and that's, that's, the, that's the disruption. So they're all grabbing market share. Um, uh, 
uh, and that's fascinating, of course. Now, so it's, it wouldn't be, again, an exaggeration to think of it as a tsunami or a large wave, and if you, if you don't know how to ride a wave, well, better learn to swim, right? Um, here's an, here's a, in, an important figure. In 2018, last year, the um, size of the global investments in, in the fintech space was $40 billion, and that number keeps growing. Some people argue that uh, 40 billion is actually a conservative estimate. Uh, the actual number is probably significantly higher, depending on what you would consider fintech. Um, there's another number 40, which is also interesting, and that's the number of unicorns which are fintech related globally. So what is a unicorn? So unicorn is a private company which is worth at least $1 billion. So with that level of market valuation. Uh, there are 40 of them around. In fact, more than 40 of them around, slightly more. So that's pretty interesting. And a lot of this is happening uh, in different hubs around the world. In Wales, where we are right now, uh, um, plenty of interesting activity in the fintech space is already happening. And a newly formed body called Fintech Wales has, uh, has uh, come into shape in order to coordinate this effort. But Let's pause for a minute and think about how we got here in the first place. So I want to invite your attention to think about three snapshots in time. Um, in 1999, just before the burst of the dot-com bubble, these companies were the four largest companies in the world in terms of market valuation. So that's how the stock markets would value them. Um, and you can see I've put three of them as logos and one as not a logo. Uh, so the ones that are in logos are the tech companies, right? But of course the dot-com bubble burst, and then, uh, and then the situation changed. Fast forward 10 years, and you have a slightly different picture. Uh, so the four largest companies were some energy companies. Uh, you still have Microsoft there, but you also have a finance company, ICBC, the Chinese bank. Now fast forward another 10 years to the latest data we have, and care to guess what the four largest companies today are? Well, they're all tech, right? Uh, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google. So big tech has re-emerged. Um, if you think this is just the top four, let me, let me show you what the top 10 look like. So these are the same four companies, now look at the rest of them. These are the 10 largest companies in terms of market valuation right now as we speak. The ones in red are tech companies. The ones in blue are finance companies, right? So what happened? It seems that big tech has re-emerged. And what's really interesting is that big tech is getting into finance. Um, now, traditionally, big tech companies were reluctant about getting into finance, uh, especially after the 2008 crash, because the financial services sector was heavily regulated. They were not very keen to get into that. But um, more recently, the tech sector is also being regulated, is being watched closely by the governments, as you can see with, for example, Facebook. So, so the tech companies are thinking, well, we are already being regulated, or we are going to be regulated, so let's diversify our incomes and get into finance as well. So the, this battle between the red and the blue, the big tech and the big finance, I think is going to be a very, very interesting um, uh, phenomenon to watch in the next few years. Which one is going to dominate? Um, now, as exciting as all this progress is, we, we should also be uh, cautious about the level of overexcitement and the hype that is also in this market and in this sector. And this is important because the hype can cast a shadow on the actual real progress, on the legitimate use cases and applications of these technologies. But how would you measure the hype? Um, it's difficult, so you need to have some suggestions and indications. So I'm going to invite your attention to a number of examples of the hype in the fintech space. Uh, 
These are some cryptocurrencies which have been heavily backed or promoted by celebrities. And unfortunately, in this case, all three of them, and more broadly, many, many others like these, have been involved with fraud and wrongdoing, and uh, financial regulators have basically issued cease and desist orders against them, um, which just shows um, in, one, in one way how how hot this market is and how overhyped and overexcited this market is. And of course the celebrities are not helping in this sense. Uh, this has become such a problem that the United States regulator, the SEC, um, did something clever. Um, they wanted to educate investors, so they created a fake web page um, and a fake ICO initial coin offering, and they included uh, pictures of fake celebrities with endorsements of this so-called cryptocurrency called Howie's coin. And, uh, and they also put some science into it. They included a white paper. So many people clicked on the link, actually, uh, and uh, showed interest. And then they were forwarded to the real regulatory web page, which basically cautioned them against this. So here's another example. Um, you may have heard of this, a company called Long Island Iced Tea Company, which produces iced tea mostly in America. Um, just before the end of 2017, changed its name to guess what? Long Blockchain Corporation. And just because of that corporate name change, uh, their share price went up 430% in, in a day, in fact in a few hours. Now, that's, uh, there's, there's no rational way to explain this apart from just the overexcitement of the market. In fact, this company, um, they very transparently said, we are thinking about using the blockchain technology. So there was no fundamental change in their, in, in their, mod, in their business model. It was just an, a declaration or an announcement. But that announcement was sufficient to excite the markets to this extent. And this is not just happening in the United States, unfortunately. Uh, it's happening around the world. For example, in the UK, uh, a company called Online PLC changed its name to uh, Online Blockchain, and then the share price went up 400%. Um, in China, um, a company called Sky People Fruit Juice changed its name to Future FinTech, and then the share price went up 200%. So these cosmetic name changes, uh, that lead to such exaggerated market reactions can only be an indication of the hype and the emotions in the market. And remember, they're not really, these companies were not really um, changing their business models in any fundamental way. They were just announcing that they might get into it. Uh, now, new studies show that these are not exceptions. Unfortunately, this is a pattern. Um, speculative mentions of the word blockchain in financial disclosures has been shown to lead to similar market reactions. Um, now, Shakespeare famously wrote, um, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So it doesn't matter what you call a rose, it is still beautiful, it is still very sweet smelling. But in the world of finance, it matters what you name companies. And uh, in, a, in a famous study, which was called arose.com by any other name, some researchers found that during the dot-com bubble, those companies that simply added dot-com to their names, again, experienced the market value, overvaluation by about 75%. And this was just about association. Again, they were not changing anything fundamentally. They were just adding dot-com to their names. But the story goes beyond that. So um, as, you, as you may know, this is the famous Bitcoin price chart. Um, uh, in 2000, at the beginning of 2018 or end of 2017, it reached um, a price of about $20,000 and then it crashed. Now there's every compelling reason to think that this was a classic speculative bubble. If you go back sufficiently, long in history, you have seen examples of this before, we have seen examples of this before, and there's a body of academic studies about this. For example, uh, in the 17th century, 
um, tulips, exotic rare tulips, were so overvalued in the Netherlands that you could basically uh, buy houses in the center of Amsterdam by exchanging a few tulips. Um, now, of course, we're not suggesting that bitcoins are like tulips, but the underlying excitement and psychological emotions that, that um, form this speculation are very similar. And if you, um, if you read uh, the insights of uh, psychologists, um, uh, basically the idea is that in, in these sorts of speculative bubbles, what happens initially is a bit of excitement about a new innovation, which then leads to euphoric levels of excitement, but then in inevitably panic sets in and then they crash. And what's, what's very interesting is that these emotions, many of them are unconscious emotions. People like Freud have talked about this. Um, so that's why it's very difficult to learn from experience because these emotions are not conscious emotions, they're actually quite unconscious emotions. So all technological innovations can can lead to overexcitement. With financial innovations, that danger is even more so because there's the promise of abundant wealth. And that's what we need to be careful about. So I want to conclude by reminding you that um, there have been many examples of innovations in history which have not survived the test of time. Um, Snow screens for the face, a family bicycle, or a single wheel motorcycle are just three of those examples. It's, it's extremely important to remain optimistic and excited about the future that FinTech promises us, but also just not get overexcited. Thank you very much.